English by the Nature Method by Arthur M. Jensen. Brought to you by Ayan Academy. Chapter 53 A Trip to Brighton. When Storm started working at the office, it was decided that he should only remain as long as the clerk, whose work he was taking care of, was ill. But when the clerk was able to take over his own work again at the beginning of the new year, the manager wanted Storm to stay on for a few months longer. I shall be very busy the next eight months or so. We're planning to open some new branch offices, so it would be nice to have you as a sort of private secretary. I shall need your help very badly. Storm was only too glad to get this chance of staying on, because he wanted to see the spring in England of which he heard so much. A week later, everything had been settled. He was to stay in England as long as the manager needed him. So when May came, he was still in London, working hard. Summer had come, and as the weather had been extremely fine for several days, Marshall and Storm decided to go to the seaside for the weekend after a particularly busy week. A weekend at the seaside would do us good after a week's hard work, Marshall said. And even if it may still be a little cold to bathe, the sea will be beautiful, and the fresh sea air will be nice after the bad London air. What is the best place on the coast to go to? Storm wanted to know. I think Brighton will be best, Marshall answered. It's a pleasant town on the south coast of England. We could stay the night at one of the hotels and return on Sunday evening. Fine, said Storm. Let's hurry home from the office, then, without stopping for lunch at our usual place. Perhaps your mother will prepare a quick lunch for us at home while we throw a few things into a bag. We shan't need much more than a toothbrush and a comb, so there won't be much to pack. We'll have enough time before our train leaves. Speaking of toothbrushes, Storm said, I must remember to buy some toothpaste on the way home. I noticed this morning, when I was brushing my teeth, that I had used up all my toothpaste. I think I'll try a shop I've often noticed. It's only a short distance from the underground station. You know, the one which has an unusually large sponge lying in the window. It must be fun to use a sponge as big as that in the bath. You could almost wash the whole body with it at once. I saw some beautiful brushes there the other day, too. I'd like to buy them for my sister. She takes a lot of trouble with her hair and brushes it carefully morning and night. So those fine brushes will be just the thing for her. One for her hair and one to brush her clothes with. Perhaps there's a comb to go with them too. Well, don't be too long about your shopping, Marshall said. I shall have to look for my bathing costume. My mother puts it away every winter and never twice in the same place. So I can't be sure of finding it at once. Do you think it will be warm enough to bathe? Storm asked. Then I'll take my bathing drawers, too. Bathing drawers? Marshall said. Haven't you got a bathing costume? At one time, you were not allowed to use bathing drawers. But nowadays, it's perfectly all right, of course. However, we English are funny in many ways, you know. By some people, bathing drawers are still regarded as not quite the thing for bathing. Well, I haven't got anything else, so I'll have to take them along, Storm answered. Two hours later, the two young men were sitting in a bus on their way to Brighton. The distance from London to Brighton is only about 50 miles, Marshall explained. So I thought we might go there by bus instead of by train. The country between London and Brighton is very beautiful, and you'll see more from the bus. The trees will be looking their best now. There will be flowers in bright colors by the roadside. And the leaves and the grass will be of that lovely fresh green that they only have during the weeks when spring is turning into summer. I want you to see England at its very best. In May, in the country, when everything is fresh and clean and full of peace and beauty. It's funny, isn't it, that although I should not like to live in the country, May always makes me wish to spend the summer in the country, to see the corn standing green in the fields and the cows happy in lovely deep grass. I quite understand how you feel. Storm replied, and I'm glad we came by bus. I'm really seeing the country this way. Look, Marshall, he continued, isn't that a windmill we can see in the distance? Yes, it is, Marshall replied. We still have a few left, although in most places factories have taken over the work of making corn into flour, which the windmills used to do. Factories can make flour cheaper, I suppose, and as bread is such a large part of the nation's food, it's important, of course, that flour should be cheap. What a lot of work must be done to the corn, Storm said as he looked out over the fields. 
In the course of the months from the time when the farmer puts the plow into the ground in spring until we put the bread on our tables. When the ground has been broken by the plow, the seed is put in, and then after five or six months the corn is ready to be taken to the mills or factories to be made into flour, and at last it is made into bread. When the corn has been taken to the mills, there is still something left of the plant, which is used for the animals during the winter. Not all the corn is sent to the mills. Some of it is used for next year's seed. Yes, Marshall replied. In town you usually don't think of these things. You go into a shop, ask for some bread, and in the course of a minute or two you leave the shop with the bread you have bought. Just as easy as buying potatoes. And yet, how much more easily potatoes are grown? Time passed quickly on the road. Every few minutes the view changed. They passed through some small towns with beautiful old houses, between rose bushes that grew in long rows along both sides of the road, full of red and white flowers, or looked over bright green fields, pleasantly broken by a few trees here and there, a thing which is typically English. They arrived at Brighton about four o'clock, and one of the first things they did when they reached their hotel was to order tea. I'll take mine with lemon today, Storm said. I like it best that way when I'm hot and thirsty. Won't you try it too, Marshall? You won't regret it. Yes, I'll take lemon in my tea too, for once, Marshall replied. But I'll have to take at least three lumps of sugar to make it sweet enough. Oh, I say, Storm, look at that little dog over there. He's looking at our sugar as if we'd taken it from him. We'll have to give him a lump of sugar. He doesn't look as if he belongs to anybody here. He must have come here by himself. While they were having tea, a band started playing in the restaurant. Do people dance here in the afternoons? Storm asked, noticing that they were playing dance music. No, not at this hotel, Marshall replied. But there are several restaurants where you can dance at this time of the day. There will be dancing here tonight, though, as far as I know. Have you noticed that they have seven or eight instruments that they aren't using? I suppose that means there will be a large band playing later on and that there will be dancing then. Would you like to go to some other place to dance? No, dancing on a nice afternoon like this has no attraction for me, Storm said. Besides, I want to see as much of the town as possible while we're here. Right you are. Let's go then, Marshall answered. We might walk about a bit. I want to show you the attractions of the town, just like a professional guide. Here, ladies and gentlemen, you see, etc., Brighton is full of cinemas, theaters, restaurants, music halls, and all kinds of places where you can have a good time. I really think that although Brighton is a seaside town, its attraction for many of the people who come here lies more in these things than in the beach, Marshall explained as they left the hotel. Really? Storm asked. You would think that, first of all, people come here to bathe, since this street, with all these hotels on one side, is situated almost at the very edge of the sea. You only have to walk a few steps across the street and you find yourself on the beach. What is the beach like here? It's rather good, Marshall replied. On this part of the coast, the beach generally consists of small round stones which don't hurt the feet at all. In fact, many people prefer these small stones to sand. Sand, they say gets into your shoes and your stockings and your hair and gives you a lot of trouble before you get it out. However, if you prefer sand, I know a place not very far from here where the beach has lovely red sand. We might go out there tomorrow. I think I'd rather try this place, Storm answered. Perhaps there's sand enough on the shores of your own country, Marshall said. I think I prefer the stones myself. They're quite comfortable to lie on. Just a minute, Storm interrupted. I must ask you to explain the meaning of a word you used just now. Sure, I think it was. With pleasure, Marshall replied. It means almost the same as beach, but not quite. Both beach and shore mean land at the edge of a sea or a lake. But while beach is only used about a low piece of land with sand or small stones at the edge of the sea or at the edge of a large lake, Shore may also be used where the land rises sharply out of the sea without any low pieces of land at the edge of the water, as for instance at Dover. So you see, a beach is always a shore, but a shore is only a beach, if it has small round stones or sand, if you know what I mean. Thanks, I think I do, Storm said. 
At least I know enough to be able to find out the rest when I read the word or hear somebody use it. But tell me, don't you think we might be able to get a boat somewhere? Yes, that's easy enough, Marshall replied. There isn't wind enough for sails, though. And besides, I'm not very used to boats with sails, so I should prefer one of the small boats that you see down there on the beach. You need not be afraid, Storm said. I know all about boats and sails, so I'll take care of that side of the matter. Oh, in that case, Marshall answered, I don't care which we go out in, as long as you'll be the captain. But I think it would be a good idea to wait until the evening before going out, he continued. As far as I remember, there will be a moon tonight, and if the weather doesn't change, the stars will be out too. But after all, we had better take one of the small boats, for whatever little wind there is will be gone tonight. The sea was as smooth as glass when they went out in a small boat that evening. There was not a single wave on the surface of the water. What a lovely sight it is, Marshall said, with the moon and the stars up there in the sky, and at the same time, shining back at us from the smooth surface of the sea, and all the lights from the many hotels on the shore. Yes, I'm glad we waited till it was dark. It's a sight I shan't forget, Storm replied. When they got on shore again, Marshall suggested that they should have a look at the nightlife of Brighton. Our nightlife is not what they call hot in America, but we might look in at a few places and see if there's any fun going on anywhere. They did as Marshall suggested and passed a very pleasant evening, returning about 11 o'clock to their hotel to have a glass of something in the restaurant before turning in. The band was much larger now than in the afternoon, and all the musical instruments were being used. It's almost too much of a good thing with all the noise the band is making now, Storm said. I liked it better in the afternoon. That's because we weren't dancing, Marshall replied. Could we do that? Storm asked. Yes, it's quite proper to dance with girls you don't know at seaside places like this, Marshall answered. There will often be girls staying with their families at the hotel, or young women spending a little holiday alone, who are usually glad to have a few dances with you. Let's see if we can find two pleasant-looking girls. Look over there, Marshall, at the three women at the table, especially the one to the left. What on earth is she doing? I think she's beating time to the music with her hand, he answered, perhaps to show that she can dance and is willing to, if anybody should ask her. I must say they're a strange collection, those three. They must be at least 15 years older than they're trying to appear. Look at the other one now. She's putting still more red paint on her lips and powder on her nose and cheeks. I wonder what they look like under the surface of powder and paint. You should look over there instead, Storm said, noticing two girls of about 20 entering the restaurant in the company of a man who looked old enough to be their grandfather. They were tall and good-looking, not beautiful, but with a clear skin and rosy lips and cheeks for which English women are famous. Have you noticed the way the smaller of them is walking in time to the music? Musical people often do that. I am sure she dances well. In fact, both girls moved across the dance floor with the grace of young animals. If they dance with as much grace as they walk, it should be lovely to dance with them. Do you think they'll dance with us? Storm asked. We can only find that out by asking them. But let's give them a chance to taste their wine or whatever they're having before we ask them. Did you notice that they're both wearing very beautiful jewels around their necks? Marshall continued. As far as I can see from here, the tall girl's jewels are quite like her sister's, except that the stones of their jewels are of different colors, for I suppose that they must be sisters. I shouldn't wonder if they are, Storm said. How different are these two from the three painted ladies over there? You can easily see that when you compare the quite good taste of the two girls' jewels with the loud jewels our three aunties have hung around their thin necks, gold and silver, and stones in all colors. Yes, I suppose their jewels must be expensive. But they look as if they might have been bought at one of those stores where nothing costs more than sixpence, Marshall replied. Well, shall we ask if the girls would care to dance with us? We had better go one at a time. You first. Which of them have you thought of asking? Storm wanted to know. The smaller one. But I don't want to go first, Marshall replied. Well, if I'm to go first, I shall ask the small one, Storm laughed. I like the way she moves in time to the music. So did I. However, I'd rather not go first. But if they care to have more than one dance with us, perhaps I might have a chance later of trying how well she dances. All right, run along now, Marshall said. And don't forget to bow to Grandpa and ask him first if you may dance with one of his young ladies. Storm collected all his courage and walked up to the table where the two girls were sitting. 
As he came nearer, he noticed that the taller of the girls looked a little like Marion, and so at the last minute he decided to ask her. First he bowed once in the general direction of the table, then he bowed to the old gentleman, and at last he bowed to the girl and asked in a voice that he hardly recognized as his own, May I have the pleasure of having this dance with you? Soon they were all pleasantly talking together, and after the first few dances the old gentleman invited them to move over to his table. On Sunday evening, the two friends went home by train after having spent a very pleasant weekend at the seaside. Mm -hmm.